Um, so just as a note, a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about today, um, in the early parts of the slide, we're going to tell you how some things work. If we're talking about on-metal decommissioning, this is what we're running, not what we're doing upstream. And then a little later, we'll talk about what we're going to do upstream. Um, so um, first of all, um, who are we? Um, well, we're the Rackspace Teeth team. Um, the, our team motto is to destroy proprietary control of the data center. And for us, that means using open software and open hardware wherever possible to um, commoditize the data center. Um, so all the um, hardware we're going to be talking about today is open compute hardware designs. Um, all the software that runs this, at, in, in so much as we can, is completely open source. Even code that we may talk about today that we're running downstream, that is still in Garrett. You can go look at it today. You can run it today. Come into OpenStack Ironic Channel. We'll help you run it. Um, and what does the Rackspace Teeth team do? Well, we built Rackspace on metal. Um, it's built on top of OpenStack Ironic, and it integrates Ironic with our public cloud. So if you're a Rackspace customer, you can call our API, the exact same one you would to get a virtual machine, use a different flavor, and instead you get a piece of hardware provision to you in minutes. Um, so what is Ironic? Well, it's not <laughs> 90s pop music. Um, much as I could, you know, it's not um, rain on your wedding day or anything like that. It's actually um, the bare metal program for OpenStack. So um, we kind of want to bring a little rock and roll to this rather than, um, than kind of going, going with the nostalgia. We want to move forward, um, talk about new stuff. So, so how, do, how should you think about Ironic? Well, I like to think of Ironic uh, as a bit of a bare metal hypervisor. Um, on almost any Nova hypervisor you use today, there's going to be an API there. You have, um, in, in our example here, you see that Nova with Zen, you have Nova API receives a call that makes its way through Nova to a Nova compute. That Nova compute calls a Zen API, which has all kinds of internal state, just like Ironic would, except for it's hidden from you, um, and it builds a VM. Um, with Ironic, it's the exact same model. You've got an API request to a Nova API that eventually gets to a Nova compute, and instead of having a Zen driver loaded, it has an Ironic driver loaded, and instead of knowing how to talk to the Zen API, it knows how to talk to the Ironic API. Um, so this does fit a general model of what you might have thought about for um, the way Nova works today. One of the big notable differences, though, is if you see, we have a box over here around our Zen setup. That's because if you're using a traditional hypervisor, generally, your Nova compute, whatever hypervisor API you're calling, and your virtual machines are all on the same box. However, with Ironic, you're going to have independent Nova computes. You're going to have a completely independent Ironic environment and then completely separate bare metal nodes to deploy to. Um, so there's a little bit more orchestration involved. Um, and obviously, with a hypervisor, you, you sort of have um, God access over the VM. You can do whatever you want. You can set up things. You have that, that kind of in-band access to do things. But, um, so how does Ironic do this? If you've got a bare metal node, how, how would Ironic control it? And there's, there's two primary methods. We generally refer to them as in-band and out-of-band. When we're talking about in-band methods, we're talking about a, a RAM disk that we booted on the server that is actually running from the perspective of an operating system. Um, and some of the things that are done almost exclusively in-band today would be disk imaging, whether it be actually writing the image to the disk or exposing the disk as an iSCSI target to be imaged. Um, and disk erasure. There's also out of band, um, you know, like your typical, your, your BMC, your management controller, an ILO, a DRAC. There are many, many synonyms for this. I'm going to be calling it the out of band during um, this talk. Um, and they're, they're, uh, the out of band generally is used to handle power control, what, what device you're booting from, getting a serial console working. Um, and then there's, there's sort of this place that's a gray area where you can do some of these things in band or out of band depending on hardware. Those would be like firmware flashing, BIOS updates, and BIOS settings. So these are the tools in Ironic's arsenal for getting a um, tenant workload on a machine, getting that off, and then cleaning it up. So we'll be talking about these tools as we go throughout and how we're using them to clean up the nodes. Um, so as I said before, this is kind of a continuation of the story that Jim was telling yesterday of um, you know, us wanting to, to build on metal and looking at um, Ironic. We originally went and did our own thing. We called it Teeth Overlord and Teeth Agent. Um, we pretty quickly realized with the um, urging of some of the more senior Nova people at Rackspace that um, that maybe wasn't the right path to go. 
So instead, we went to, um, to do Ironic. But um, we saw there was a lot of stuff missing that we really needed. And so um, I want to talk about this a little bit, and then we'll, we'll dig deeper into one of those a little later. So what was missing? Well, we needed boot from disk. The existing driver, when on metal was created, was um, predicated on Pixie booting the instance every time, um, which actually is kind of an HA problem, because if you have a control plane outage of one of your conductors, that instance, if it's rebooted during that time, might not be able to come back up, which is not a good customer experience. Um, we wanted to support whole disk images. We wanted to, um, to be able to pre-boot those nodes to avoid a post-it deploy time, whereas, ironic today, um, nodes are expected to be power off when they're deployed to, um, and that saves us three or four minutes of provisioning time on every server that's provisioned. Um, we also wanted a, a more complete RAM disk that included some fleet management tooling. The RAM disk that comes with um, what it, today in the ironic code is known as the Pixie driver is actually built using Disk Image Builder, and it's very slim down. Um, but if we're going to be managing a large fleet of nodes, we need a way for our ops people to get in, diagnose hardware problems, et cetera. So we wanted those fleet management tools in there. And finally, and what's going to be the focus of our talk today, is cleaning up after an instance is deleted. Ironic didn't do this. Um, so, so what did we do to, to kind of try to solve all these issues? We built IPA, and, and no, not the beer, the Ironic Python agent, um, which is a REST API for managing, and, um, for managing bare metal nodes. So we boot a RAM disk. That RAM disk does a lookup in Ironic to see what node it is, and then exposes a REST API that Ironic can call to do those in-band control actions we were talking about before. Um, and along with that agent, you also have to have a driver that's partnered with it. So we created the agent deploy driver for Ironic, um, which is what tells Ironic how to communicate to the agent and use it to deploy. So why IPA? Why, what's so good about this that made us want to write it? Well, the big thing for us is that IPA is pluggable. Hardware is wild, wildly variant. Um, you know, you might be running hardware in your data center today that I've never even heard of. So we wanted a model that would allow you to integrate your own um, needs into an agent that Ironic talks to. And so what are, um, what are the, the two key parts of this? One is that um, we have a hardware manager, manager interface. And you can override almost any um, stock IPA function that touches the hardware with your own in a downstream hardware manager if you choose to. And also, this was designed with custom RAM disk images in mind. Um, and today, we have um, one Pixie bootable RAM disk and an ISO, and we have another one coming. So let's talk about those RAM disks. The one that exists today, and we actually have a job that builds this. Um, so if you go look at, if you want to play around with this, we do have a job builds on every commit for IPA um, and publishes to tarballs at OpenStack. Um, and that RAM disk runs under CoreOS. Um, we find that CoreOS is very easy to customize. It has a lot of um, tools for OEMing things into your own images, which we needed to get some tools in there. Um, and it does have a complete user space. We can SSH in there. We can um, do things to the operating system, diagnose hardware problems, troubleshoot deployments, et cetera. And also it has a, a real init system, mainly system D, which would respawn any agent should they crash so that we don't have nodes left in a weird state. Um, there is a disk image builder RAM disk that's in progress. Um, the review is linked on the slide, and um, you, can, you can also find our slides online. I'll put that back up at the end of the talk. Um, the main thing that the disk image builder RAM disk is going to be a lot better for is um, people who have memory constraints. So the key place here is, is the gate. So today, the agent driver um, CI runs with one gig VMs. Um, whereas the normal Ironic CI runs with 512. So, so we do want to get that disk image builder RAM disk so we can kind of slim it up a little bit and get that working a little better. Um, and I mentioned before we supported ISOs. Well, I don't mention an ISO on here because the ISO support can take an arbitrary kernel and RAM disk, put those into an ISO that's suitable for booting on virtual media, and that support exists for the Pixie driver today as well. So, um, so I've told you a little bit about the background um, what we've been doing, why we've been doing it, but let's talk about um, what this means for on metal today. Um, why do we need it, first of all? Um, and, and just as a note, you might see or hear us say decom or decommissioning interchangeably here. That's primary from um, one of the major lessons we learned, but we didn't make a slide about it because it's a little embarrassing. Decommissioning, very hard to spell. And very hard to spell. So. <laughs> We use DCOM um, as to avoid the squiggly lines in, that makes PowerPoint unhappy. So, 
Um, so why do we need this DCOM support? Well, deploying to the cloud is all about having your, your users have a stable, consistent platform. And you can't guarantee that consistency unless you've made sure that um, nothing's happened while that server was provisioned because your hardware state may have changed or failed while it was provisioned to the last tenant. And um, you also want to make sure that any remnants of that tenant are gone. And so I have a reference up here to um, a bug from Grizzly that was filed against the Nova bare metal driver um, about 18 months ago saying that tenant data was left on disks. We're here to save you. We're fixing your bug. Um, so so um, what should DCOM do? Well, DCOM could do firmware upgrades. Um, and in fact, pictured here is one of the IO cards from our IO flavor, which every time we DCOM, we um, put a firmware update on that to ensure consistency. It should secure erase devices, um, devices such as the 32 gig data state that I'm pictured. Um, finding anomalous conditions and components. And this is, um, this is actually one of the more interesting things we've used DCOM for so far. Um, Josh actually built out a uh, step in decommissioning that actually verifies that the ports that our servers are plugged into are accurate based on what Ironic thinks, which is very important to compare the real world to what Ironic thinks, because obviously Ironic only has those in-band and out-of-band tools, whereas the data center ops people have 10 fingers and two hands. Um, much better tools. So um, it could also flash or configure a BIOS. And, and this is, again, one of those things that kind of falls over to the out-of-band as well. But there's also some stuff that DCOM shouldn't do. Um, we really don't think DCOM is suited to doing burn-in testing of hardware, that that might be something better done with a heat template. Um, it's not for tenant-specific configuration. We had a design summit um, session about that this morning on hardware capabilities. Um, and so that would be the route you do for that. Or really discovery of newer changed components or any sort of hardware interrogation to find out what's going on. That again is being handled um, outside of DCOM uh, as a part of another effort inside Ironic. So um, what we're going to do now is Josh is going to sort of zoom in here and talk about how Ironic um, and the agent collaborate to decommission nodes. Thank you, Jay. All right, so this is the same slide that Jay showed earlier with how Nova works with Ironic. Um, but I'm really going to zoom into the bottom three boxes with Ironic and the, the nodes. So how does Ironic work? Um, Ironic's your basic distributed system. You've got APIs and conductors in a, in a hash ring. Um, the basis for Ironic is that there are drivers. You need a different driver for the different types of hardware that you have. So you have like ILO drivers, DRAC drivers, stuff like that. And then there's deploy drivers, which are, uh, manage how you do the deployment onto the, like, the disks. And it, it also works with decommissioning. Um, so in this example, like if you called Nova boot, the Nova boot goes through Nova, and then it calls down through the Nova driver to the Ironic API. The request then, uh, I, the API will look up the node in the database, figures out which driver is working for it, and then finds a conductor that can handle that driver and passes it down to the, the conductor, or finds a conductor that can handle that driver, sorry. Um, and then that conductor shells out to the, the drivers, and the drivers are what actually talk to the nodes. So in this case, I have uh, IPA and IPMI would be one type of driver. That's what we use in OnMetal. Uh, but you could also have like a Pixie and ILO driver talking to some HP hardware. So how, do, how does a, a node actually get provisioned in Ironic? So here's a, a state diagram. Um, nodes that are like powered off, ready to be provisioned to, start in a no state. When you call Nova boot, they move into a deploy state, and that's where the driver writes the, disk, writes the image to the disk, gets a config drive on there, stuff like that. Once that's completed, then it moves to an active state. And that's where the tenant is on the node. They can do whatever they want with it. They can keep it for as long as they want. Um, and then when they call Nova delete, the node will move into the teardown state. Now, the teardown state doesn't really do much. It does some internal cleanup on the conductor. But after that, there's no verification or anything. It goes directly into a no state. And in this instance, uh, new nodes, like if you rolled in a new rack and wanted to get it on Ironic, goes directly into that no state. So we want to do decommissioning. So we felt the easiest way is to add a new state in here. So we added the decom state after the teardown. So same as before, you have a, a tenant in an active state. They call delete. It goes into teardown. Teardown does a very minimal set of steps. And at that point, the node is removed from the user's list of uh, active instances. We, <laughs> we don't want DCOM to take like four hours and your node's saying deleting for four hours. Customers <coughs> not, might not appreciate that. 
Uh, so after that, it moves into a decom state. Decom is where we do all the work that we're going to talk about here. Um, and then after decommissioning is done, it moves back into the node state, and it's ready for provisioning again. At that point, we know the node is working, the hardware is working, it's ready to be deployed to, its networking is working. Um, and that's the reason we think for a new node, it might sound kind of counterintuitive, but you should put a new node into decommissioning first, because that'll really verify that the node's working. Uh, it could, could also be called ready state, and that's what we might call it upstream. But So how, do, how does IPA fit in here? Um, like, Jay talked about, like Jay talked about, uh, we have a hardware manager. The hardware manager is a thin, uh, is, a, is a small <coughs> set of Python. Uh, it's got a Python API, basically just functions like write to disk, do decommissioning, stuff like that. Uh, it has a list of decommissioning steps, so each hardware manager can determine how you want to decommission something. And then we have vendor tools. So like we have uh, uh, a tool that flashes the BIOS. We're obviously not going to put that in the upstream because you're not using the same hardware as we are. Um, or, or you could be. Uh, <laughs> um, or like tools to erase our, our I.O. cards, stuff like that. And then we also include some versioning in there. I think this is kind of important. Uh, you don't want to flash an older BIOS. And then the next step, you boot a new agent uh, with a newer version of the, the decommissioning. And all of a sudden, you're applying settings for a new BIOS that you don't actually have, and everything goes crazy. Uh, so we had versioning in there to avoid that. And these hardware managers are broken up into pieces. Right now, there's a generic hardware manager. And this is just all the things that we expect any piece of hardware should be able to do. So it's like write something to a disk, uh, erase that disk using secure ATA erase. Um, choose which disk you want to write the, uh, the image to. So like in our example, it's, or in our case, it's any node bigger than like four gigabytes. We don't want to write to like a, a floppy drive or something. Uh, and then we have our own hardware manager called the OnMetal hardware manager. This is a big monolithic piece of Python that does all the steps that we need to provision and decommission nodes. It's monolithic, it's not, it's not great, it, but it works. Um, so, you may be asking, like, how does, how does IPA and Ironic work together with the hardware manager to do decom? Uh, here's a decent diagram. Um, basically, once you get into that decom state, uh, Ironic is going to call decom. That comes down to the driver again. The driver is going to talk directly to IPA and tell it to start decomming. It's going to pass a target state to the agent. And in the first step, it'll be none, which signifies that it's the, the first state. IPA is going to list all of its decom steps, find the first one, uh, execute it. Uh, and then IPA is going to report that it's finished that. It's going to report what the next state is. And optionally, it can ask for a reboot. So IPA is running in-band. And the, the only way you can reboot the node is like sudo reboot. That's not good if you're doing something like upgrading a BIOS or a firmware or something. You want a nice hard power off from the, the out-of-band. So Ironic has to do that. Um, and this is one of the problems that we ran into. Anyway, so it passes that target state back up. Uh, and this is really key because the, we're running a RAM disk for IPA. If it reboots, it loses all of its state. It doesn't know which step it was on. You get into an infinite loop. doesn't really work very well. So Ironic uh, runs decom again if there's a step. It tells it what the next state is. It runs, continues, until Ironic says it's done. And those steps that I was talking about look something like this. Uh, this is what we have. Um, this is just a basic version. Uh, the key part here is that there's a priority. We really want to run these steps in a certain order, so we order them by priority. Like, you don't want to apply the settings for a BIOS if you have a BIOS update coming. So you want to do the update BIOS first, so that would have a lower priority, or higher priority, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, and then the, the settings would be after that. Uh, and then they can also request a reboot each step. So that's how, that's the basics of how decommissioning works. Uh, it sounds pretty good. Jay's going to tell you how it actually worked. So, um, so thanks, Josh. Um, and that's what's running today. If, um, if you deleted an all-metal server right now, you're going to get a decommissioning that looks somewhat like that. We haven't listed every step we've done because, quite frankly, some of them are quite boring. Um, but this is open source, and I believe on a later version of that slide, there's a link to our, um, to our um, hardware manager we use. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the real world. Um, this isn't a dream. This is something we're doing today, and we're doing it successfully. In fact, On Metal runs DCOM over 1,000 times every day, and we do this with great success. Um, we see a less than 
0.1% failure rate when running these, and those failures are usually environmentally related and are simple to clean up. Um, this is really important because it has to be reliable. Humans aren't reliable. If you give your ops person a set of steps to clean up a server, they might not always happen reliably. But Ironic today with IPA is doing this and it's successful. But let's talk about when it's not so successful. Um, so we have a, a few kind of hardware shortfalls we've fallen into. And um, one interesting thing to note is that you know, we didn't see this in our hardware lab. We didn't see this in our small staging environment. Only when we started to scale up did we see these issues because they occur at such a small percentage rate that um, they just never emerged in any other environment. Um, so like for instance, on our hardware, updating BIOS um, automatically has caused some issues. Anything from um, freezing the system up long enough that um, the agent was restarted by system D to um, sometimes even making our out of bands go, go away and require a hard power cycle. Um, and honestly, we even had a few nodes that um, we were forced to RMA due to these BIOS update failures. Um, and so it it's kind of reinforces the idea that if you're going to run something in DCOM, the very first step is not try to run DCOM and Ironic, it's try to run DCOM yourself. You have to know your hardware, you have to understand your hardware in order to successfully clean it up. So what else? Well, um, we, we kind of tried. I talked a little bit about our verify ports. We um, attempted to implement a verify properties as well, which would make sure that the amount of RAM, the number of CPUs in the system is consistent with what Ironic's reporting. But we ran into a bit of a problem. Um, we found that different manufacturers, even for the exact same spec memory chip, report subtly different values um, for the amount of actual bytes of RAM on the, um, on the node. So the fix for that it would be to allow a small percentage variance in reported memory when you have a large cluster that might have um, hydrogenous memory manufacturers in it. Um, but we have not yet implemented it with that fudge factor. That's something that, um, that we still have ahead of us. So um, the other one, and, and anyone who's, who's had to do some of this will, will sympathize, is that vendor utilities don't work well on a RAM disk. Uh, now I mentioned our RAM disk is based on CoreOS. CoreOS generally runs pretty close to vanilla kernel. So you're talking about, um, we're running utilities. So for instance, your BIOS flash utility, according to the open compute spec, um, which I've linked here and I'm citing, the, um, the OS standard is CentOS version 5.2. Um, and as you know, if you have a piece of software that's written by a vendor to run on CentOS 5.2, it can be pretty fun to get that to run on anything else. Um, in our case, we actually had to do some extensive testing. We found that um, just symlinking the newer version of the library into the older version's location was sufficient in our case for getting this resolved. Um, but this is just kind of, kind of a warning. You know, you, your environments are not always going to be the same as maybe your vendor um, feels like. So those are, those are kind of some of the hardware problems we've fallen into. Um, we have a couple of other states which come up um, rarely, but I, we tend to believe that that has more to do with environmental issues than um, hardware issues. So um, what are some of the shortfalls of the actual software today? Um, and this is what we did in On Metal. These are some of the lessons we learned as to what we want to change. Um, right now, what we're doing downstream, it only supports the IPA driver. So that means if you have an ILO or DRAC or something that allows you um, out of band access to do more interesting things during DCOM, um, that's not supported if you're running our downstream version. Um, and that, there's actually some really interesting stuff you might want to do with that, like rotating your BMC passwords. Um, given that it all happens in band right now, we can't do any of that. Um, and, and, and as a patch that we're using downstream, it, we're not sharing it with the community. Um, we really want, um, we think decommissioning is important to Ironic, and so we want to have a solution that's going to work across every driver um, in many people's use cases, not just what all metal needs today. Um, so let's talk about what DCOM is going to look like in Kilo, and for that, Josh is going to come back. Thank you, Jay. Uh, yeah, so obviously there's, there's a few problems with what we did. It's very specific to our environment. We need to do something that will support more types of hardware, more types of decommissioning. Uh, so we're going to change it up a little bit. Uh, so this is the slide that I showed before that shows how hardware managers work. You've got a generic and a monolithic on metal uh, hardware manager. Uh, the easiest way to fix this would be to break it up into uh, multiple type, multiple hardware managers that get mixed together. 
Uh, so you still get your generic that does all the basic stuff, and then maybe you'll have a hardware manager for your NIC uh, to do some upgrades, your storage devices, maybe a JBot or something. Um, you'll have a, a BIOS, so you'll have like an HP BIOS flashing utility, a, a Quanta BIOS flashing utility, and then uh, different types of verification, whether you want to verify properties, ports, uh, the, the stuff that we were using to do the verify ports is very specific to the switches that we use. Uh, they use some vendor extensions for LLDP packets or, yeah, uh, won't work across the board. Uh, so you'll need something specific for your own hardware. Uh, and, and we think there could be a, a, a decent ecosystem for this kind of stuff, uh, like pre-built RAM disks with all the hardware stuff that you need for your specific platform. Uh, the, the other main thing that we need to do is change how the steps are created for decommissioning. Um, before, it's it's almost completely driven by uh, the Ironic Python agent. Uh, obviously, that won't work if you're not running IPA. Uh, it also doesn't give you access to the out-of-band stuff. So our proposal would be to do all of this in Ironic itself, push it up the stack a little bit. Um, so each of your drivers will be able to submit a list of steps that it wants run, uh, and with the same like priority ordering that you had before, so in this case, uh, for our hardware, you would have the IPMI management interface uh, submitting a list of steps like rotating passwords. You'd have IPA listing all the steps from your hardware managers, like erasing disks and updating uh, firmwares there. Or if you had like the DRAC and the Pixie driver together, you could also do any steps that those require. Um, so in Ironic, how it's going to work is you'll get the list of steps from each of the drivers, exactly the same as before. You're going to sort them by priority, and then you execute them in order. Uh, and then you're, you're going to pass those executions down to each driver so that they can manage how they want to do it. For example, IPA is going to have to talk to the Ironic Python agent. ILO has to know how to talk to an ILO. Um, and it'll, it'll go through the same, the same step with the same, like I said, the same priority. Uh, in this example, the first thing that you're doing is up, updating a firmware on your ILO, and that'll happen out of band. And then you are asking the IPA to upgrade your BIOS and erase your devices. So now we can support in-band, out-of-band. We can support pretty much any hardware that you can write a driver for. There's already a pretty rich ecosystem of drivers, so this should be a pretty simple fix. And that pretty much covers what we want to change up in Kilo. Um, help us? <laughs> um, we, we don't want to do this all on our own, uh, and we have a design session tomorrow at 9 a.m.? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, one of the... One of the nice things is that, that I really think is important to revisit is um, we said help us. Well, first of all, you know, you've got to help yourself. And so at the beginning of this talk, we talked about all the things that Ironic didn't do that we wanted it to do. Well, it does it now. Um, everything on this list, including the two that aren't merged, are things that um, On Metal is doing in production today. We do it all the time. It's stable. It works. Um, but Boot from disk, support for whole disk images, a RAM disk that includes fleet management tools, that all shipped with Juno. The IPA driver is there, it exists today, you can use it. So the only two things left off of that initial list is um, a spec we call long running deploy RAM disks, which um, Jim has been working on, um, that is targeted to Kilo, um, as well as the spec for the decommissioning that we've been talking to you today, that has a spec up. We do have the code up um, for some of that as well, and that is also targeted to Kilo. But how can you help? We do have the design summit session for the decommissioning we're talking about. Today is tomorrow. So if you think our ideas are good, come learn more about it, help us design it. If you think our ideas are bad, come tomorrow, help us design it. That's really what you got to do to help, is you have to participate in the process. Um, and this includes operators. I have a strong sysadmin and operations background, and because it's so important to understand how your hardware works, especially the input of operators who've managed fleets before, you'd be very appreciated if you have an interest in this to, to come to our Design Summit session and, and help us understand maybe some of the pitfalls that we haven't run into yet. Um, and also, a general plug, the specs repos tend to scare people sometimes and um, feel like owner's process. I've been reviewing specs in Ironic for, um, about one cycle now, I find it great to know what's coming up next, to be able to have input into things, um, and, and it's really great. And again, you don't have to be a, a Python pro to go look at those specs. If you're an operator, go look at them. If we have bad ideas, tell us, and let's find something that works for everyone. Um, so 
The other thing you can do to help is ask good questions, um, which that part is about to start now, but I do have a quick cross-promotion. Um, we actually discovered today that um, uh, Peter from Bloomberg is giving a talk immediately after this on this same floor. It's not in this room. I believe it's on the big room at the end of the hallway where um, they have open compute hardware platforms and are going to be talking a little bit about the nitty-gritty of managing that. So um, if, if you're curious about that, you should go see his talk. Um, we had a great conversation today, and it sounds like a lot of his experiences mirror what we've seen as well. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, we'd love to field them now. In, in order to do that, you would have to prevent that node from being scheduled to. So for instance, in an environment where you have high churn, like in um, a typical public cloud scenario, you're going, you, there's no way to really guarantee that a node, once it's deleted, it goes back into no state. You would basically be racing to deploy your image to that node before someone else's image to that node. Um, also, again, that would be limit you to just the in-band tooling rather than the full suite of in-band and out-of-band tooling, which, as we talked about, we learned is really necessary to have a complete decommissioning experience. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, in fact, it's something I, I meant to mention earlier. Um, generally speaking, um, we've been using um, our vendor utilities that have um, verification function. So for instance, our BIOS flasher is verifying that the BIOS matches what we expect it to be, and we don't flash it if that's the case. Um, we do that with almost all of our firmwares. We do a verification of the firmware if it's already at the correct version for, for exactly what you're talking about. We have concerns about flash exhaustion. I don't know the answer to that question, and I don't want to learn it the hard way. Um, we've talked to our vendors about it, and they advise that what we're doing is, is, is smart to not reflash it every time. No, no, like, like yes, we're actually, it, it takes the, um, so the typical BIOS update would be verify, flash, verify. This does the verify. If it matches the um, BIOS we expect it to be, it stops, and it doesn't rewrite it. Um, Um, our devices don't have TPMs. In fact, um, part of the benefit of using open compute hardware is that it does trim out a lot of unnecessary components, um, which gives us a um, smaller surface to have to secure. A lot of that stuff is, is under NDA with us and our BIOS vendor. That's kind of what I was talking about when, when we can't authenticate it. We do have signed firmwares, though. Every firmware that's on an all-metal server is signed, um, and when we do use that, we do also have some additional security mechanisms, but like I said, I I'm not really at liberty to talk specifically about those modifications. That's that Absolutely. That's why, like we said, knowing your hardware is very, very important, and, and it's, you know, doubly so for us running a public cloud with it. Um, we work very closely with the internal people at Rackspace, as well as, um, the vendors to make sure that we were able to do this um, in a way that we felt was secure. And, and in addition, this mirrors processes that happens at managed hosting providers um, throughout the world today already, except for instead of having a human do some of these steps, we're having a computer do some of these steps, which makes it more reliable and allows us to add more steps to it, um, which we appreciate. Yes, in the back. We, we haven't experienced that problem um, exactly. I mean, quite frankly, if you give us a credit card to spin up a very, very expensive server, um, we have a very good fraud team. Um, that's, that's not something that, that we've run into yet. Um, I'm sure we will, and when we do, we'll, we'll continue to work with our hardware vendors, and, and we'll recover it. Like, part of the reason for DCOM, and if any of these steps fail, the node is kicked into a DCOM failed state and stays there until we've inspected it, we've interrogated it, we've seen what's going on. Um, and we've actually had situations where we've specifically caught hardware failures. So if you were running um, Ironic without DCOM, 
and you had that type of hardware failure, the node would go directly into no state and the next tenant that got scheduled to it would get a broken server. Instead, we get a node that fails decommissioning with a message as to how it failed. We also specifically today do not power off the node after that type of failure, so the logs are still available on the agent for us to go see what happened. Um, and this is basically the process we had to follow when um, we had the issues upgrading BIOS um, with our initial deployment. Um, well, I think he got you first. It takes about 30 minutes. Um, most of that is secure erase um, of the SATA DOM. Um, we want to work more closely with our hardware vendors in a um, revision of hardware to, to help take that time down a little bit. Um, but we find it takes you know about 30 minutes. That can vary based on how long posting time takes. And um, between our three, three different flavor types, there actually is a, a pretty significant difference in how long each one of them takes to post. Are you allowing people to attach external volume to these instances? Are these are cookie cutter instances. This is a cloud. We have, we have you know, nodes that look like every other node. Customers can't really change that. Um, I do think that, that there's a clear need for some type of network, divide, network, um, network attachment, attached storage there, kind of like you would typically have in a cloud um, using something like Cinder. But we don't allow our customers to modify the hardware at all. That's, that's, the, that's the exact point of, of providing hardware in a cloud is we want it to be a consistent experience, um, which, which means you have to trade in as, um, as um, it was said in the keynote yesterday, you have to trade in your precious servers to, to get the speed in the API. So if you got a, you got like a 64 gig flash card in there, that's the disk space you have on that instance? Yes. Um, and, and in fact, that, that sort of reflects how, how we expect people to use these servers. Um, we are looking forward to this support. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to, to that support. Um, to, to be honest, when we were originally planning this product, we, we almost wanted to not put disks in there at all and instead have them be um, completely ephemeral. But um, we found that that was pretty difficult to implement. So um, the, the 32 gig SATA DOM was what we did as a compromise at that point. Most of the trusted boot stuff I've seen so far is about a testing that an image on a specific piece of hardware behaves a certain way. We give our customers the option of using many different images, as well as, um, you know, we eventually hope one day, just like we do in our cloud, to allow custom images as well. So I think that that maybe doesn't fit very well with the technology that exists right now in the cloud, but, but I can tell you that we're doing research every day to try to implement things that um, anything we can do to add extra layers of security. Yeah, that's, that's actually true. We do have trusted boot support that, that's going on. Um, Intel's working on that right now. In Ironic, um, downstream, we aren't doing it right now. So upstream, yeah, we're looking at it, yeah. All right, well, that is time for our session. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Again, please come to our Design Summit session tomorrow if you have uh, an interest in this. Thank you.